Spawn has officially joined the fight in Mortal Kombat 11, marking the character's first appearance in a video game since his guest spot in 2003's Soul Calibur 2. So what better reason to talk about crappy old comic book games? Ha, <laughs> as if I needed an excuse. There has been a slew of video games based on Image Comics over the years, more than you might think. In recent years, the publisher has had a couple of gaming hits on their hands, with titles like Telltale's The Walking Dead and grim and gritty first-person shooter The Darkness. But for me, when I think of Image, I think of the 1990s. The era of big guns, big <clears throat> attitudes, and artists getting tendonitis from all the little tiny cross-hatching. For that reason, this isn't going to be a comprehensive guide to every single Image game. Let's face it, I could spend hours just talking about the many mediocre spawn titles that have disgraced our consoles. Instead, let this be a brief overview of the games that came out during the 90s, and some that didn't, starring the darkest, grittiest, most extreme superheroes on the spinner rack. Hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels, and this is a history of terrible Image Comics video games. Image Comics, for the uninitiated, is the third largest publisher of American comic books. Back in the early 90s, a handful of Marvel's best-selling artists had driven comics collecting to an all-time high, breaking all kinds of crazy sales records and gaining a devoted following. For their troubles, Marvel rewarded them with… well, not a lot actually. Aside from the standard page rates that all work for hire artists got paid, Marvel retained the copyrights to all of their original characters, and heavily merchandised artwork created by freelancers with only modest royalties on the back end. In addition to this, artists like Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld, who had co-created fan-favourite characters such as Venom and Deadpool, and felt that they should have earned more editorial control over their work, clashed with writers over story direction and their unconventional artistic affectations. Feeling frustrated that their significant contributions were going unrecognised, a group of eight creators organised a mass exodus to form their own company. These were cartoonists Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, Mark Silvestri, Eric Larson, Jim Valentino and Will Sportatio, as well as longtime X-Men scribe Chris Claremont. And so, in 1992, Image Comics was born, with its singular mission statement. Image would not own any creator's work, the creator would. Todd McFarlane's Spawn was undoubtedly the breakout star of the early Image Comics lineup. The Canadian artist's immense popularity propelled Spawn's debut issue towards a whopping 1.7 million copies sold in 1992, making it the highest selling creator owned comic book up to that point. The character's enduring popularity has meant that just last year the title celebrated its 300th issue, and was subsequently crowned the longest running creator owned title of all time. On the foundations of the character's comic book success, old Toddy Mac would go on to build what he calls the four pillars of Spawn. Toys, cartoons, a movie which we'll talk about later, and of course, video games. Todd McFarlane's Spawn, the video game, is a side-scrolling beat-em-up release for the SNES in 1995. It will be the first of several video games based around Image's flagship anti-hero, and to be honest, it's probably the best. Although that's not saying much. Play as Al Simmons, aka Spawn, as you cape twirl and karate chop your way through the grimy back alleys of New York City, to the 8th level of the Darklands below. Face off against well-known adversaries from the comics such as Violator, Overt Kill and the Maleficent Malbulgia, as you fight to save the lives of 13 innocent children who have been kidnapped by the Mad One. The game was developed by Japanese studio Ukiyote and published in Europe and North America by Sony and Acclaim. At the time, Acclaim were best known for publishing a string of mediocre licensed titles, including many of the 16-bit Marvel games that hold a special place in my heart. Not now, Maximum Carnage, I swear to God! At first glance, Spawn appears to be just another generic side-scrolling superhero game. Walk right and wallop ne'er-do-wells. Ah yes, I see that you know your judo well. But it's the authentic comic book stylings and atmospheric soundtrack that truly elevate this game above your average 2D action platformer. Just like in the comics, Spawn has a life force meter that is depleted by using any of the character's many special moves. In the pages of Spawn, McFarlane used the necroplasmic power meter as a way of ramping up tension, and it's no surprise that this unique storytelling device, which was basically just a supernatural health bar, should make its way into a Spawn video game. Aside from being accurate to the source material, it adds some depth to the kick-punch gameplay by forcing you to focus on conserving energy rather than just spamming special moves. 
Beyond that though, Todd McFarlane's Spawn, the video game, certainly isn't breaking any new ground. And releasing a month after the launch of the Sony PlayStation, it might have been considered archaic before it even hit store shelves. But I think it does a great job of capturing the look and feel of early 90s image comics. This is what Spawn is all about for me. It's gothic and moody and supernatural, but all through the lens of a comic book for kids. And there's something very endearing about that. It's devoid of any sense of irony or try-hard edginess. Just spooky vibes and good times. Now, I know it seems weird for me to start a video about terrible games with one that I actually quite like, but trust me, it was all downhill from here. In the early 1990s, Jim Lee was very much the artist's artist. His polished style and more restrained layouts lent an air of glamour and sophistication to his work at Marvel, where he was seen as the archetypal company man. But when Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld convinced him to jump ship to form their own company, it sent a shockwave through the industry. If Jim Lee wasn't loyal to the big two publishers, then who was? Unfortunately though, of all the founding fathers of Image Comics, I personally find Lee's original creations the least appealing. Wildcats are basically just the X-Men, but without the driving force of Chris Claremont, and also just a bit shit. They even got their own Saturday morning cartoon, which, again, was just the dollar store X-Men. Right, you might as well give them a video game as well. Marvel's team of Merry Mutants have had bloody loads. Nineteen ninety five's Jim Lee's Wildcats Covert Action Teams, that's the full title, is a 2D side scrolling brawler for the SNES. The game was developed by Beam Software, but published by Playmates, who also produced a line of Wildcats toys, meaning that this game, along with the cartoon it was based on, are just glorified toy commercials. Play as not Cyclops, not Wolverine, and not Beast, and fight your way through wave after wave of the same old mutants and robots before a final showdown with Not Magneto. As is the case with Spawn, the music in Wildcats is one of the few highlights. The soundtrack was arranged by Tommy Tallarico of Earthworm Jim and Neversoft Spider-Man fame, and it's legitimately fantastic. There's even an SNES arrangement of the cartoon's theme tune, which, despite what I've just said about that show, it had one of the best intros of the 90s. Other than that though, there's not much to say about this one. It's about as generic and forgettable as 16-bit beat-em-ups get, and it's made all the more infuriating by the fact that even though you can select which of the three characters you want to play as, you can only progress by completing tasks in a certain order, which means lots of dead ends and trial and error. Add to that clumsy platforming and confusing level design, and it all culminates in a game that is way more frustrating than it is fun. It's a hard pass from me, go and play X-Men Mutant Apocalypse on the SNES instead, which, rather appropriately, does everything that Wildcat sets out to do, but is infinitely more successful in its execution. Throw enough crap at the wall and see what sticks. That was Rob Liefeld's business model, and to be honest, creative strategy in the 1990s. Say what you want about the artist who gave Steve Rogers those 38 double Ds, but the kid sure had a lot of ambition. When he wasn't breaking industry-wide sales records with X-Force issue 1, co-creating iconic characters such as Deadpool and Cable, or founding publishing companies with his friends, he was trying to expand his empire into toys, cartoons, and indeed video games. Sadly, at the time, Liefeld's grasp often exceeded his reach, and his long comics career is littered with abandoned projects and burnt bridges. One such cancelled project is 1997's Youngblood Search and Destroy, a real-time strategy game intended for release on multiple platforms including PC and Sony PlayStation. According to promotional material for the game, Search and Destroy would feature a fiery cocktail of furious 3D action and strategic RPG elements, as well as a tangled web of player-created storylines across 11 real-time combat missions. Of all the games on this list, Youngblood Search and Destroy is the one that most piques my interest and I'm actually really sad that it never saw a full release. Maybe that's just because I'm, hang on, let me check the comments on my last video, uh, a shameless Rob Liefeld fanboy who looks like an ugly woman? But I do think that the isometric RPG style of the game would have set it apart from the default side-scrolling beat-em-up superhero titles of the 1990s. Rumour has it that this game was in the final stages of development when it was unceremoniously axed by publisher GT Interactive Software. However, a forum post by someone claiming to be a developer brought on to salvage the project claims that the title went through two years of production hell before the lead programmer quit. According to this source, Youngblood originally took a minute and a half to load to the title screen and would leak several tens of megabytes. A playable demo of the game was released, 
and is still floating around online for those curious enough to try it out. Next up is another unreleased game based on one of my favourite characters from the early Image era, Shadowhawk. Notable for having possibly the least practical costume for a crime fighter who skulks around at night. I think the idea was that his shiny chrome costume would reflect his surroundings and therefore allow him to blend into the darkness, but in that case, why not just wear a black costume? Well, either way, he sure looks cool and it allowed artist Jim Valentino to come up with some really awesome chrome gimmick covers. Oh, mama. If you've ever wondered what kind of sucker would be so easily attracted by shiny comics, I was and I'm still that sucker. But it's not just the covers that make Shadowhawk a worthwhile addition to the Image Comics superhero stable. On the interior pages, Jim Valentino combines blood-splattered violence with Saturday morning cartoon visuals to create an off-kilter but unmistakably 90s vibe that keeps me picking these up whenever I find them in back issue boxes. Shadowhawk is Batman meets Robocop set to a synthwave soundtrack, and it's a spine-snapping good time. As is becoming a recurring theme with these image creators, Jim Valentino had big plans for his breakout vigilante, with action figures produced, the TV options sold, and a video game that Valentino financed himself. Unfortunately, Shadowhawk, developed by Studio E in 1994 for the SNES, would never see release due to a lack of publisher. But the story doesn't end there. Fast forward to 2003 when a prototype board featuring a nearly finished build of the game appeared for sale on an online forum. The seller, alleging to have come into possession of the game while working for Valentino's Shadowline Studios in the mid-90s, struck a deal under the proviso that the game's ROM would be dumped as an act of game preservation. Sadly, this didn't happen, and the prototype changed hands multiple times until eventually coming into the possession of bootleg maker Rose Coloured Gaming. They set up a GoFundMe to produce a limited run of 100 copies, with a sleek black cartridge and box art that would make Spinal Tap jealous. I don't think he's right. There's something about this that, that, that's so black. It's like, how much more black could this be? And the answer is, none. None is that good? more black. Only 36 of these 100 copies were sold before Jim Valentino, who it turned out had never signed off on the sale or reproduction of the game's prototype, threatened the company with legal action. Still, with 36 bootlegs out in the wild, it was only a matter of time before the original seller got his wish, and the ROM got dumped for all the internet to enjoy. Honestly, I wish the game itself was anywhere near as interesting as the story behind it, but it's just a very cheaply made 2D platformer. Shadowhawk's grappling hook from the comics is incorporated into the gameplay in the style of Bionic Commando, and the end-of-level boss fights transform the game into a Mortal Kombat-style fighter. But even by 1994 standards, this game looks rough, and it's not really surprising that Valentino couldn't find a publisher to release it. Of the 36 copies of Shadowhawk that were sold, you can regularly find a couple of them listed on eBay boxed and sealed. And as unimpressive as the game is, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want one for my collection. From the minds that brought you Wildcats comes another X-Men derivative. Gen 13, created by Jim Lee, Brandon Choi and J. Scott Campbell, is a superhero team comprised of gifted youngsters and pitched at teen readers. The comic was an attempt to capitalise on the so-called MTV generation, with characters called things like Grunge and Burnout. <sighs> and you thought Snowflake and Safe Space were bad. The more female-centric lineup heralded in the bad girl movement in comics that would dominate the late 1990s, while the shift in focus from capes and costumes to grounded teen drama hinted at the shape of image comics to come. Hoping to cash in on this hot new license from one of the hottest creative teams in comics, multiple developers pitched to procure the rights to a video game adaptation of Gen 13, and tech demos have surfaced online from studios such as Real Time Associates. Ultimately though, it was EA and Grey Matter Incorporated that won out. The result, while never finished or released, was a 2.5D side-scrolling beat-em-up for the Sony PlayStation that would allow players to control any member of the original Gen 13 team. Sadly, or maybe not, depending on who you ask, the game went unpublished after Grey Matter went bankrupt. There's not a whole lot known about this title, but the archived gameplay is giving me serious Fantastic Four on the PS1 flashbacks, so I think I'd like to move on before the 70s adult movie soundtrack kicks in. Oh God, here it comes. You are the dead man. See you in hell, Al. Oh 
We started with Spawn, so let's end with him. 1997 brought us Spawn the movie, which got some things right, but most things very, very wrong. But continuing the trend in this video of terrible things having great music, the film's soundtrack is chock full of absolute bangers. 1997 also saw the release of Spawn the Eternal for the Sony PlayStation. Yay. Much had transpired in the world of gaming in the two years since Spawn's SNES outing. With 32 and 64-bit consoles like the PlayStation and the Nintendo 64, video games had entered the third dimension. Titles like Tomb Raider and Super Mario 64 redefined how games looked and controlled, inspiring countless imitators. Spawn the Eternal is very much a post-Tomb Raider game. The maze-like levels encourage exploration, with plenty of puzzles to solve and precise jumps to tear your hair out over. But here's the kicker, whenever you encounter an enemy, the whole game transforms into a 2D fighter, akin to something like Tekken. Whether it's one of Spawn's most notorious nemeses, or just some 2-bit thug, everything comes to a screeching halt for an awkward confrontation in a subway station. Merging these two disparate gameplay styles seems like a genuinely good idea on paper. At a time when the kinks were still being worked out of 3D beat-em-ups, with plenty of games featuring particularly clunky controls, bothersome cameras and wonky hitboxes, switching to a more traditional style of gameplay seems like an elegant solution. The reality though is that it totally ruins the flow of the game, and feels like a totally separate production, one as equally ill-conceived as the 3D platforming section. The game takes place over three eras, and follows the adventures of three different Hellspawns. You start the game as Al Simmons in the present day, but you are soon transported back to prehistoric times as the Savage Spawn, and to 16th century England as Medieval Spawn. Disarm your enemies in combat. No, really. You can literally rip off a dude's arm and club him to death with it in this game. This was such a prominent feature that the game's entire marketing campaign revolved around it. What's perhaps most surprising about Spawn the Eternal is that it was a first party title developed by Sony. This game has all the hallmarks of a cheaply made cash grab superhero joint from some studio that nobody ever heard of. But really? Sony made this? Really? Listen, I hope you don't have a gluten intolerance because these graphics are grainy. This might have looked okay for the time, I suppose, if your only point of reference up to that point had been playing Doom on the SNES while someone throws handfuls of sand in your eyes. Interestingly, there was another Spawn game released for the PlayStation around the same time that was exclusive to Japan. Well, I say game, Spawn the Ultimate was a multimedia disc that contained clips from the movie as well as stills and VFX breakdowns. But anyway, terrible tank controls, painful platforming, and a face only a mother could love. From the deepest, darkest pits of hell that this game came, it shall remain. Even if Todd McFarlane does pop up from time to time to threaten us with a remaster. Put simply, Spawn the Eternal is the very worst that licensed titles have to offer. Up there with E.T. for the Atari 2600 and Superman 64. A truly terrible Image Comics video game. I'm Todd. If you love comic book video games as much as I do, Panels to Pixels is your one-stop shop for news, reviews, and all that other fun stuff. Make sure to subscribe, comment, like this video, and share it with your friends. It really helps the channel out, and it makes you look even cooler than you already are. Thanks for watching as always, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.